Hey there, it's Alina, your friendly nuclear physicist. You have been requesting for a reaction video to Kyle Hill, and this is exactly what we are going to be doing today. I don't know much about him, but I know that he is a science educator and an entertainer, and I will leave a link to his channel down below in the description so you can check him out. Without further ado, let's get into it. On April 26th, 1986, reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded. <laughs> at first, actually, it said the I land in nuclear power plant. Thousands of kilograms of radioactive material and fuel were launched into the sky, and burning metal sent contaminated particles into the air for days. This deadly detritus would go on to contaminate over 100,000 square kilometers of Europe. Over the next year, 600,000 men and women known as liquidators would go to extraordinary, sometimes deadly lengths to suppress, remove, and or sequester the most dangerous footprints of the disaster. By the middle of December 1986, an immense, unprecedented engineering effort would result in the sarcophagus, a concrete tomb for the remains of an exploded core that would remain radioactive for at least the next 20,000 years. So the sarcophagus was built by the liquidators, as was mentioned in the video, and uh, because it was built so soon after the accident itself, the area, of course, around the reactor was highly, extremely highly contaminated, and uh, you would uh, have people working basically for a couple of minutes per day because of the amount of the dose of radiation that they were receiving. So they would literally run to the construction site, uh, make something or build something for a minute or like 30 seconds or depending on how close they were to the core or not, and then run back and then the next person would go and then they would ch change shifts like that and then they would go again the next day. And that is how they built the sarcophagus. So not only the fact that the construction itself is big and it's of course time consuming to build, uh, as, in, as any other engineering construction, but the fact that the radiation level was so high that the people were receiving such great uh, levels of uh, radioactivity into their bodies, but still at the same time managed to build this is uh, quite impressive indeed. The sarcophagus was a band-aid over a nuclear knife wound, only designed to withstand the next 30 years. And so 20 years later, in 2007, the project contract for the new safe confinement was signed. It was a giant arch, a design chosen from hundreds of other ideas that would weigh more than the Eiffel Tower, be taller than the Statue of Liberty, and could be slid into position over the sarcophagus, allowing its construction to be hundreds of meters away from dangerous radiation. So the idea with that, of course, after the years has passed, the area still remained contaminated as it would remain and it will remain contaminated for a thousand years. Uh, the problem was that they wanted to construct something that would last longer, uh, that the sarcophagus basically wouldn't withstand for so many years. And uh, the idea was to not build it again over the reactor, but they thought to build it away from the reactor in a safer area that is not contaminated and basically place it on. So that is how they came up with the idea of an arch kind of type of containment because it was the easiest one to basically slide on because they built it around 180 meters away from the reactor uh, area itself and then with uh, trail rails, train rails, then with train rails they slid it in uh, on top of the uh, reactor building. Another interesting thing to mention is that um, this kind of construction they call it here confinement whereas the typical kind of uh, a building around the reactor is called containment building. There is a little bit of a difference between these two words and the reason why we use them differently is because a typical containment building is there to contain the gas, uh, radioactive, let's say, waste or uh, gas that can be produced uh, during operation or during an accident that can be radioactive and is contained in the containment building. The confinement building is built in order to prevent the solid radioactive material to spread into the environment. When it was moved into place in 2017, it became the world's largest mobile structure. Yeah, no wonder. A nuclear tomb built to shelter the corpse of Chernobyl for a target of a hundred years. And today, I'm taking you inside. Ooh. Okay, so it's uh, quite recent. It's actually 
a year ago that it was filmed. Uh, I was actually planning to visit the Chernobyl exclusion zone myself in the beginning of 2022, but of course with the events and everything that has happened ever since, uh, it was impossible to do so. So I really hope one day I will get to also go there and uh, visit it and also get some awesome content for you guys. Though thousands of people have toured the zone since the disaster, though the NSC is easily the most iconic image of Chernobyl today, to my knowledge, almost no one has been allowed inside to document what I'm about to show you. I, along with a team of nuclear scientists and engineers, were allowed a few precious minutes inside of the NSC. With the explicit permission of the Ukrainian government, we were there to learn what it's like to manage the world's worst nuclear disaster as your day job. Hopefully, by the end of this, you will have learned, as I did, that the most dangerous place in the zone isn't as terrifying as you may think. You lose something in the most famous images of Chernobyl. Scale. Out of necessity, almost all the photos you've seen of a Reactor 4 are from the air, or very far away. But once you are right up next to it, you realize... Hmm, I guess this is actually true, because all of the pictures and everything was taken from so far away that you can't really perceive how big the construction and how massive the, the reactor building actually was. So yeah, that's a very good point. And an internal diameter that could fully contain the Roman Colosseum. Wow. Five years ago, the new safe confinement was slid into its design position. This design position encases both the building and the sarcophagus now, keeping radiation, radioactive dust inside. It is easily the most iconic image of Chernobyl. So, of course, the reason why they would change their clothes before going there is in case of any contamination or in case of uh, anything that can happen basically there. You, of course, don't want to bring this on your clothes back to your home and spread it around. These clothes, I'm pretty sure, are checked regularly and uh, decontained or thrown away if uh, something happens that uh, gets on them or some sort of contamination. Uh, also, I would assume that one of the things that's hanging around the person's neck is a detector, a radiation detector to basically detect the um, levels of radiation that uh, the body is receiving at the moment. And hence, I'm assuming the way they calculated how much time they're allowed to stay there is based on the level of radiation that they would receive by staying inside the new safe confinement. So therefore you cannot stay there for long enough, even if you would want it to, or even if other people would allow so, because the levels of radiation you would receive would actually be very high. Still in your clean clothes provided by the power plant, going inside the NSC first means entering through the technological building, the structure's nerve center, where workers constantly monitor radiation rates, air quality, and more inside the dome. Far from being secretive about Chernobyl as a day job, the head of radiation... I never thought everything would look green inside. <laughs> like the walls have this strange green shade. ...safety at the power plant explained at length the inner workings of the shelter, let us film whatever we wanted to, and took questions from our foreign engineers and scientists for almost an hour. So this is actually true. There is a lot of even, let's say, tourist... Uh, um, organizations that can uh, basically coordinate these kind of visits to the Chernobyl exclusion zone and the nuclear power plant and people can ask questions and people can visit and look around and take pictures and record everything. So it's pretty much a very open space, uh, very differently treated from how the Soviet Union back in the days treated the situation and basically try to, to hide in in secrecy everything that happened. So people are very open about it, people are discussing about it, people are explaining how the situation looks now and what are they doing to prevent uh, the radiation uh, spilling any further or to basically contain this as best as possible for the years to come. And it's really great to see and uh, it's actually very refreshing. It was time for us to see the sarcophagus. We donned more protective gear than anywhere else in the zone. White clothing again. Hard hats, gloves, booties, new masks, and plant-provided radiation detectors that would tell us exactly when we'd have to leave. When there is so we should leave, we must leave immediately. Touch nothing, sit nowhere, and don't drop anything. 
if you drop something, it stays there. Oh, they are inside. So cool. I mean, not cool, but Entering through a literal airlock, you are immediately struck by two sounds. First, the cacophony of white noise produced by the dust suppression system inside the dome. Hmm. And second, the immediate desperate chirping of your radiation monitor as you blow past the safe limit you set for yourself outside. <laughs> So the radiation detectors are going crazy here, I would assume. Oh, oh, man. Here, inside the NSC, the ambient radiation rate is over 100 times higher than almost anywhere else in the zone. It only gets yep. hotter the closer you get to the sarcophagus. And it wasn't just our Geiger counters that were affected. Many months later, when we eventually went through this footage, we noticed something fairly sober. The white pixels you see here, popping into and out of single frames of footage, are actually visual artifacts from gamma rays leaking out of the exploded core and elephant's foot and hitting the camera sensor directly in front of our faces. Interesting. So gamma rays are basically photons, so they are like light that can interfere and cause these kind of artifacts to show, but it's very interesting how they actually noticed i'm not sure if you can verify that that was actually the case and how you can verify that but if that is the case it's a very interesting thing when you get to the new safe confinement under the arch as they call it one piece of clever engineering hits you almost immediately and i mean that almost literally because you can hear it when you open and close the doors this entire shelter is supposed to be negatively pressured that is to say that the outside atmosphere, one atmosphere, that's going to be larger than the atmospheric pressure inside of this dome. Now, the engineers and scientists want it to be that way because if there is any eruption or excursion or hole in this dome, the pressure will, will force air in, but not out. In that terrible event, they do not want more radiation, more dust escaping the new safe confinement. Rather, the Earth's atmosphere would act to hold it inside it's kind of it's actually a very smart uh, thing to do yeah to have a negative uh, pressure and basically suppressing the inside compared to the outside of the of the dome i'm not sure how long that would last in case of let's say as he said there was a hole uh like what if what would happen if eventually all of the dome was filled with air then there would be no pressure difference anymore uh but um yeah it's uh it's a, yet another thing that they came up with to make it even more safer like the same thing that happens at uh, biological laboratories and their safety levels to prevent the excursion of viruses but that's a small lab this dome is taller than the statue of liberty it's too easy for media to get the idea that the chernobyl disaster is now a forgotten tragedy a deadly mistake lying in some unsupervised ruins in the Ukrainian woods. Mm -hmm. Who would want to look after a place like this? But 4,000 men and women make their living here. To them, it's not a wasteland, but a work order. Not an ongoing disaster, but a day job. A job that everyone I met took extremely seriously as a duty to their country. We actually had the pleasure to meet a couple of people that worked in the Chernobyl exclusion zone in the first year of my master's. And uh, they were actually also very much invested in their projects and the work that they were doing. And uh, they even invited us to come and visit and see everything with our own eyes and ask all kinds of questions. And yeah, so it is very important for the people who live there, not only the Ukrainians, but for the people who actually have the knowledge and can help and uh, can make it better so of course it is a very good thing that there are videos out there like the one that Carl Hill did that actually show a little bit of the reality and the everyday life of the people in Chernobyl the workers the area around it and not what basically media wants you to maybe think of the of the situation and how it is now the world from everything that I've seen, from everything that you've seen, 
I think you've probably had your intuitions about this place challenged. Yes, there are dangerous areas. Yes, there are things you shouldn't touch and places you shouldn't sit down. But in 35 years, scientists, engineers, very smart people have tried to solve one of our toughest nuclear problems. As long as you follow the science, follow safety regulations, you can work in an environment like this safely. Uh, and you can imagine if this is the worst nuclear accident that has ever occurred on Earth and still people manage to make it safe enough to work there and for the workers to not get highly contaminated and still be able to, to basically exist there every day. That tells you how safe and how advanced basically all the safety features are in the nuclear industry nowadays and over these uh, past years that actually can make something like that possible. I very much respect the people that do this every single day. This is a hard legacy to carry on your shoulders. That's true. Some foreign scientists today are skeptical that the new safe confinement will really last 100 years. Even if it does, there is very little political will to help alleviate Ukraine's nuclear burden. So yeah, let's see what's going to happen when the 100 years are closing and what will the, the engineers in a generation or two will come up with in order to basically keep containing it and keep it safe for the next generations and for the next years to come. This is a really great video and uh, a lot of effort and work I'm sure has been put into presenting how the reality looks like for the Chernobyl, for the people who work there and the people who uh, live in Ukraine. And uh, it's great to have videos out there that show this kind of image instead of the image that uh, the media is showing or basically not showing over the past many years. So I really do appreciate this and uh, great job to Kyle. I really encourage you guys to go check out the full video for yourself as well. I will leave a link in the description down below. Let me know what you would like me to react to next and I'll probably get into it. You can check out my support page where you can become a member, support the channel and get exclusive content. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. Tell me what you thought about this video. It's been Alina, your friendly nuclear physicist. And until next time, see you soon. This Kyle Hill dude is good. I thought it was